Welcome to the Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 233, Gen Con Post Show. We'd like to thank all our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. Hey, and this is Anthony. Hey, look who's back. Yeah. I'm, I'm here physically. Mentally, I might be still a little hungover slash, you know, sleep deprived. So, long weekend, my friend. Long weekend. So why don't you tell everybody where you were and what you've been doing all this time? I went fishing. What? No, nah, just kidding. How was it Gen Con? <laughs> uh, <laughs> fishing for games, maybe? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, like I mentioned last time, I kind of got like last minute was able to pull together a trip. So big shout outs to my buddy Andrew here in Pittsburgh for giving me a ride and making all that work. So yeah, yeah, I was in Gen Con, uh, fifth year now, and it was a lot of fun. Met some people, designers, people that I've always wanted to meet and got a chance to meet them. Played a lot of great games, did the usual Gen Con stuff for those people who've been there. You know the drill. But those of you who haven't, you know, it's... It's Gen Con. I don't know. It, it's, it's always hard to describe it because there's certain things that are exciting. Like I did this and I did this and I saw this and the rest of it's you're just like, yeah, it's Indianapolis. So that's all the same. And <laughs> there's food trucks. That's all the same. And the convention hall is all the same. So it's, it's a matter of the, really it's about the people and the games more than anything. Yeah. A lot of times when I talk to people and I'm like, oh, are you going to Gen Con? They're like, no, I'm going to name a con right whatever their local con happens to be and i'm like oh oh well that's good but that's not gen con and they're like oh no they're they're all the same i'm like no gen yeah. yeah right and it's huge it's the trade show especially in the u.s if not in the world i mean essen is gigantic but this is really a thing in of itself and i tell most people that if they've never been they should go at least once especially if they're like a hardcore board gamer just to see the spectacle of it i think the spectacle alone the amounts of people the amounts of designers the amounts of boots the games that are being played all over the place the energy is something to behold and it's something that uh i i think everyone owes it to themselves at least once to go just because it's a thing it's kind of an overwhelming thing but it's a thing yeah 100 percent. yeah and it's it's funny because like people are like oh essen or gen con which is bigger and it's like okay essen has more games it's bigger physically and probably more people go but gen con has something like twenty thousand events over four and a half sure. days and Essen yeah. doesn't really do many events. It's not really what they're known for. They're known for the games. It's a trade show. This is Gen Con is simultaneously a trade show and a convention, you know, like a fan convention. Like it does both. Mm -hmm. And so it's humongous. And yeah. like this year in particular, like I was I mean, I went out of my way every day to try to do at least one event that was not like a game. Sure. And it was kind of cool, you know, like randomly walked by the video game thing one day and they have these two people trying to beat world records in pac-man and donkey kong so i stopped and watched that for a while you know sure went to like a, a dance thing on saturday for a little while uh you know there's just all these different things that you can do and it's fun like when leaving especially because i was with a group of people like i said i got a ride who have gone in previous years but there's like seven of them across the two cars that we came in who all did different things. Like hmm. one person just played RPGs the whole time. The other person went and saw a lot of panels and went to meetings and, and looked at all the artwork. Another person did a lot of game demos, but very different types of games than I do. And another person did spent half their time in the stadium with the open gaming area. There's just different ways to experience the con. It's impossible to experience all those ways, which is why I try to diversify a little bit this year. But I think that's kind of the fun of it is Every year, you're like, I'm going to do something a little bit different, or I'm going to do this thing that I really like, but then I'll try this thing too and see if that's cool, which you can't really do at smaller conventions because they don't have that volume of different experiences to, to kind of go through. Sure. But we're going to talk about more about Gen Con, the hottest games about Gen Con, and everybody you got a chance to meet during our feature review. But before we get on to that, Anthony, we want to talk about what our listeners are talking about. What's our question of the week? Yeah, so I asked this um, before I left. Uh, what's a board game for which you'd like to see a sequel? There's a few games coming out that do this. It happens a lot in general. Like I was looking at my top 100 list 
um, just in preparation for this. And of my like top 20, maybe half, slightly more than half are sequels in some form, right? Like Twilight Imperium 4, Brass Birmingham, Gaia Project, The Feast for Odin. The These are all like games that either iterate on a game that came before them or just like a straight up sequel. So I was asking people like, what game would you like to see a sequel to? Like a direct sequel, not necessarily like a reimagining, but like this is version 2.0 or a direct continuation of this other game. So some people gave me some funny answers. Some people have serious ones. George said he really wants one more Mice and Mystics to finish the story and give some more crossover with Tail Feathers. Chris says, Feast for Odin 2, the Steam Era. I think he's joking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Another Chris said Burgle Brothers, but they actually did just announce a sequel for that. So I don't know if that counts anymore. Um, John says Scythe 2, Nuclear Power. And I mm. actually was thinking like, a sequel to Scythe that kind of jumps forward 20 or 30 years would be pretty cool. So yeah, I'm with him on that one. Me too. Uh, We have mechs versus minions too. I think just with the IP alone, you're rife for uh, expansion and sequels on that one. Uh, Shane mentions mage Mage Knight Two, the Atlantean revolt. I think that's a game you could easily have a sequel for. Um, And then Drew's, I like his answer, even if, yeah, I don't know if actually it seems like it could work as a game, but it's welcome to T W O your perfect city. So just kind of scaling up the building out your neighborhood. Now you're building a city as a roll and write. I would like that. So yeah, some fun stuff. Uh, What about you, man? Any games that you want a sequel for? Well, I think our listeners nailed two of them that I was thinking about. First off was Scythe because Scythe is all about the inventive use of technology and especially it's very interesting, dynamic, very well known, but in the shadows designer and inventor, which I, once again, I'm working very hard not to spoil in case someone has not played the expansion (laughs) here, but I would love to see that maybe like you mentioned, like 20 years in the future or maybe nuclear age, or maybe some sort of atomic steampunk kind of spaceship thing. League of legends. Also, you know, you talked about Mexico versus minions, we always thought that this was not going to be their last game, that there was going to be other games coming from Riot Games, especially since the board game did so well. And I guess up to until now, we really haven't heard anything. And they really haven't put out a game that was really League of Legends. And we've seen a lot of these kind of MOBA board games that really haven't done a great job. So obviously having something that really met that need would be fantastic. I, I guess, you know, maybe from a, a Euro standpoint, there's a lot of great Euros out there that really could be updated. The one that kind of, you know, really keeps coming back to me because it always gets a lot of talk and a lot of interest is the Castles of Burgundy. Now there's going to be a reprint, but I would love to see that game and those mechanics in more of a modern era, just because it gets a little too bland you know, especially at this point, this game's been out quite some time, a modern update to kind of building up that area and kind of like maybe utilizing castles that are now relics of the time would probably be interesting and maybe different resources at this point, just something a little more modern, something that's not just, you know, beige, generic buildings that happen to do generic things. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm not holding out hope. Apparently that Las Vegas update they did is not really a deluxe version. It's just like a bigger box. Sure. So, uh, I guess we'll see what they do with Castles of Burgundy. For me, I have to throw out the obligatory Spirium reference. I want someone to bring it back. I gotcha. don't care if it needs new mechanics, bring it back. Civilization, like if they did a like a Beyond Earth type of thing with mm-hmm. the civilization system. And then I actually played one this last week at Gen Con. They had a prototype there of Nimiji which is the sequel from Anton Bauza to Takedo. And it is a direct sequel. It's the same size box, the same artwork uh, from Nayade. And it has the same mechanics of like the way you move around the board, but it adds in a bunch of cool new stuff, which is what I want to see in a sequel. Cause it it adds like, there's a, obviously the set collection is still there. That's a big part of it. But now you generate player powers when you stop to take a break each time um, that kind of change the game for each player between each section. There's also, like a personal player board you have where you have to work out different patterns with the fish you catch. 
There's a press your luck mechanic drawing different shrimp tokens from a bag. So I feel like it adds enough little like gamery elements to it to make it interesting and worth checking out. Like I'm going to check it out. I'm pretty excited about it. Whereas Takedo kind of gotten a little bit boring for me. So that's cool. I want to see that kind of stuff in sequels. So do that to Spirium. <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you'd like to join our revolution and try to make these sequels happen, please join us on all of our social media Outlets, Facebook, Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. We mentioned previously there's new and interesting and dynamic articles. Jen is still doing articles up there about women in board gaming. We would love for you to check out that whole series of articles up there. Our Guild on Board Game Geek, especially our Patreon account, where you can join our Slack channel, talk to us, help us guide the podcast, and get brand new episodes about bga that we record all the time so please join us here on patreon.com slash bga it helps us a great deal all right anthony so that's what's going on with us let's talk about the games that we want to get to the table you are the man you went down to gen con you saw all the great stuff so i'm going to take a step back this episode and let's know about your acquisition disorders yeah so there's a lot of stuff here, obviously. Uh, I'm going to parcel a little bit out over the next few weeks, just things that maybe I don't have full information on yet or I'm just still learning about. But there are like five games in particular that I saw or had a chance to play with a little bit that are coming up that I wanted to talk about um, as acquisition disorders. And, you know, feel free to jump in and ask questions or mock as you feel fit. <laughs> I say mock because the first game. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> this is basically the rub it in Chris's face that I got to go to Gen Con episode. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 will, I will try to hold back the tears, but I make no promises, but uh, maybe we'll leave some of the tears for the future of you. So hold on for that, because I think that's when stuff starts getting real. All right, so what do you have for us, Anthony? All right, so I got a chance to demo Marvel Champions, the card game. Uh, this uh -huh. is the new LCG for Marvel. I might... So when this first was announced, my initial response was meh. Gotcha. Uh, and I have not seen enough of the game to change that fully, but I did like the demo I had. So I would describe this as if you took the engine from Lord of the Rings and to a lesser extent Arkham, because Arkham is definitely more um, story driven and has like some more RNG elements to it. Mm -hmm. And you streamlined the heck out of it right it's quick like turns take just a couple minutes there aren't extra resources that you're collecting and managing you have your cards and that's it with the exception of some tokens you put on like the, the villain right and some status effects you can get each card has a resource icon on the bottom you use those resource cards to activate other cards so similar to like a race for the galaxy type of thing where you spend cards to play other cards. So there are no resources to do that anymore. It's just, and, and you can manipulate that and manage that. And there's ways to match them up and do different things with it. Every different hero played very uniquely. So the base game comes with black Panther, captain Marvel, iron man, she Hulk of all things and Spider-Man. Okay. Um, each of them very different. Like iron man starts with like, for example, on his hero side, because you can flip between the alter ego and the hero, and they have different powers on either side. And the, the villain will only attack you if you're on your hero side, which is kind of cool. If you flip it over to the alter ego, you, they'll they'll continue to plan their plot, which is not good either, but it's different. Um, but like Iron Man has very low stats until you put out his armor. Like there's armor cards and upgrades and things in his deck. And as you start playing those, he gains all these different abilities and can draw more cards and has more health and all sorts of stuff, right? Spider-Man has a lot of different, he has like a lot of cards to negate damage, to jump out of the way. He has cards to like infiltrate and snoop around and, and kind of reduce the value of the plot that they're generating. Um, She-Hulk can smash the, the heck out of things <laughs> captain marvel can similarly smash the heck out of things but um has some unique different ways in which she does that so there's a lot of different stuff going on with each of these the one thing i'm not sure about after like the one play that i had um in the demo is that it doesn't seem to have much of a story to it you have a villain they have schemes that they're running through they have minions that come out and you have to face them similar to like what you would in lord of the rings but I'm not really sure where that's going in terms of the story arc. And as a cooperative LCG, I feel like you need that. So I like what I played, 
I don't know that I would like it like six months in buying a pack every month. So we'll see. But it seems like this could be the the version of Legendary I've always wanted. And that's a game where like I love the IP and I love the idea of it, but I don't like the game system, so I won't buy it. So maybe I'll maybe I'll get this. I'll probably get this. What am I kidding? Whether or not I, I go all in and buy the successive packs, I'm not sure about yet. Yeah, this was something that I saw. I was like, oh, they want to make money because that's what that yeah. kind of IP <laughs> does. And I think you and I talked off Mike a little bit about this. I've always been a fan of the IP. I'm a big comic book guy going way back, but Legendary always just seemed too cumbersome. It was just it was just too much of a thing. This looks very generic, which did not pique my interest, but it 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 was it had money symbols all over it. So I, I'm sure this is gonna make a lot of the monies, uh, if not all of the monies. So I think that this is definitely something that we will be talking about in more detail as time goes on. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I'm like, I'm still holding reserving judgment because it was fun. But part of that, I'm like, I'm looking at it. I'm like, well, I really like that system. So it could be that. And I, and it's streamlined. So it was quick and easy to pick up. It did seem generic. So that's the main thing I'm worried about. Is this just a generic superheroes fighting bad guys type of thing? Or are they going to do unique, cool stuff like they do with the Arkham system? It remains to be seen. All right. So next one here, this is Masters of Renaissance, Lorenzo Il Magnifico, the card game. We saw like a rumbling of this back at Origins, like they would have a demo and there was pictures floating around the internet. But the uh, the Cranio booth actually had the prototype of this set up. So could not play the game, but got to poke around with it a little bit and then they showed me how it works. It is bigger and more intricate than I expected, but not so much as to be like a big game. So the 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 main things I got out of this are you still have four columns of cards that you're going to pull from. But all those cards go to basically the same locations on your board. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be stacking them on top of each other, uh, kind of building up these different things. And then you can generate things by running your engine from those cards. So rather than having the four different rows of cards like you would in the full game, you just have the one row. And they are color coded the same. And they do those things kind of matching them up. But you are almost always generating some kind of resources. So it is very much an engine builder it's the, the tableau is there obviously but it's it's more focused on the engine building specifically limited amount of resources you can pick up the one mechanic that'll jump out at everybody is there's this tray of marbles and they each represent different types of resources there are six of them and you when you take a turn or one of your actions can be to pick a row or a column and just take all the resources shown in that row or column and then you move the marbles around to make new ones available for the next player so kind of reminded me a little bit of like the old mechanic where you're like cross-referencing the different rows and columns of things and how you're going to do things um, based on what's there. And then you move them accordingly. I, uh, I like that. It seems cool. Um, everybody has their own faith track as well. And it's kind of a race. Like once you get to a certain point to trigger the scoring on that, if people aren't within the range that you're going for, then they're going to be, there's no penalty on this. Like there is in the full game. You just don't get the benefit of having gotten that. So it's not quite as mean. Mm -hmm. uh, they said it takes like 30 to 60 minutes to play so it's quicker the box looks to be almost the same size and again this is a prototype so it might just be a prototype box they slapped together but looking at the insert looking at the marble tray looking at everything there this looks like it's going to be a full euro size box which worries me because i'm afraid it's going to come out at like a 50 or 60 dollar price point for what is very clearly a lighter quicker game mm. i don't know what the market is for that so we'll see it comes out next year. I'm super interested in it. And I'm sure I'll pick it up. I just don't know if you can realistically sell a game that's, you know, that much less complexity wise than the original game for a comparable price. That seems kind of insane to me. I'm, and I'm not I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just worried that could happen based on recent board game pricing. Right. Yeah, I think that you're right on with that. I, I think that we've lost or the industry has lost all perspective when it comes to pricing's concerned. And they're doing kind of like the thing with movies does, which is like, hey, we have a name. Let's just, you know, charge the same amount for the previous game. But it's literally a completely different game. Promised our listeners I would stop talking about Lorenzo because we've done so for quite some <laughs> amount of time and uh, I've even gotten tired of myself talking about it but I did feel like the game needs a refresh like a complete refresh from top to bottom even with the new expansion so 
I'm generally excited about this, but as you mentioned, I already kind of have this. So if it's lighter but more expensive, then I'm going to pass. If it's lighter but more streamlined, then I might jump into this just because I'm generally a fan of the system. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I'm in the same boat. I I, I guess we'll see what happens. I, like I said, I'm going to get it. I'm just not sure. <laughs> like if it's worth it. Jeez, um, man. I got to be honest. <laughs> I'm going to buy all of these. All five games I'm talking about, I'm going to buy them. It's just, will I recommend them to people? That's the other thing. I Absolutely. Uh, the third one, I actually sat down with Philip from Board and Dice. He showed me Trismegistus, the ultimate formula. This is a new game from Daniel Tashini and Federico Pier Lorenzi, and it completes the trilogy of Tashini games with ridiculous names that start with T. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why he does this to us. And that's after Zolkin and Teotihuacan. <sighs> it's just as media people, I, I just come on, make it easier to say. <laughs> this is purportedly his most complex game. They almost nobody's played it yet, but they're reporting it as like a weight around a four, like they're comparing to like a Lacerda weight game. Sure. Um, and from what I saw, I can see that. Like the central board is, you're going to roll a bunch of dice at the beginning of the round and you're going to separate them out into six different locations based on um, the symbol on the dice. And the symbols are all these like all chemical symbols. Some of them look a little bit the same. I don't know how that's going to work out, but uh, they are all unique, like little goofy symbols that I don't recognize. And your your turn is fairly simple. You pick one of these dice from the six pools and you place it on your board. So similar to a Lacerda game. This is the thing you do. And now there are 19 things related to that that you have to think about. Mm. So when you pick your die, the symbol matters, the location matters, the color of the die matters, and the number of dice in that pool matter. So this is going to be some crazy AP, I think, wow. on this game. Then you place the die based on all those things on a certain location on your board. Uh, it basically tells you how many action points you have. But also the types of actions you take will be determined by those four things. So you generally what you're trying to do is move these cubes through these various titrations on your player board to refine it into certain types of materials. And then there are cards they require these certain types of materials that you are trying to complete that generate points and also bonuses and also other things. I'm not going to run through all the rules to this. Uh, he did give me the full walkthrough and I have notes, but that would be like a 15 minute walkthrough because it is very complicated. What I will say is I am very interested and, uh, you know, new to Shini game in general. I'm like, yes, but I'm mostly interested because it doesn't seem like his other games, right? Like you always said, Teotihuacan is like, Zulkin, but twisted around a little bit, but kind of the same ish. And I, yeah. I don't disagree. I like it, but I don't disagree. This doesn't seem like that. This seems very much in the vein of like Lacerda's style of game of the actual decision you make, fairly simple, the thing you have to do. All the ramifications of that thing are very complex and you have to think through it very carefully. And I like that. So you're going to draft nine dice over the total of the game. I feel like the game's going to end up taking three hours <laughs> based on what he showed me. So it looks heavy. It looks fantastic. I'm not 100% sure on like the artwork and the graphic design. I'm pretty sure what I looked at was a final copy of this game because it's supposed to come out at Essen. But mechanically, I'm very, very intrigued. So this is one I'm definitely picking up. And both because of the designer and what I saw. Well, I look forward to mispronouncing the name for years to come. Yeah, dude, it's ridiculous. I don't even know where this... I'm like, I'm sure it's someone's name, but like, why do you do this to us? All right, so next one. This one's real quick. Obscurio. I didn't know anything about this before Gen Con, but th the three people around me in line on Thursday, this is the game they were rushing to get. And so I did some research and I'm like, oh, this sounds kind of cool. It is similar to Mysterio, where you have one player who is using images to guide people to take certain actions and make certain decisions. And so they're trying to like find the exit and get out of uh, this particular location they're at, but there's a trader. So it's kind of like Mysterium with a trader mechanic thrown in. So I like that. So you have one person just kind of trying to throw off <laughs> the guessing and everything. It seems kind of cool. There's some like variable player power stuff thrown in there. There's like a voting mechanic, obviously, because you have the trader element. So you can't just like, it needs to be more formalized how you make that decision. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in giving this one a go. 
yeah, I'm a big fan of Mysterium, so anything that works with that is is great, especially since Mysterium is one of my favorite kind of party games for me and for other people who are not party gamers, but it does take so much time to set up and then break down. So if there's a quicker way of do that, all the better. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm not anti-trader mechanic. Like Battlestar is one of my favorites, but most trader mechanic games are quick little nothings that I mm-hmm. don't love. So you had something cool like the Mysterium mechanics to it, and I'm all I'm I'm interested. All right. The last one was a huge hit at the show. This is Point Salad, and they released it on Saturday because AEG does their like big game night thing on Fridays. So they released the, those games on Saturday morning, and there was a line like all the way around the convention center to buy this thing. So it is a light, quick, like sushi go level of game. You draft cards. There are six different types of vegetables, but the back of every card has a unique scoring mechanic. So there's a hundred different ways to score in the game. So it is literally a point salad. So you're trying to draft combinations of vegetables and point cards to work together for your specific strategy and get the most points. But everybody else is doing it somehow differently. Mm. Seems really cool. It's a tableau builder. It's a drafting game. It plays in like, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes, I think. And it's all about vegetables, which we're all about, right? (laughs) So it seems cool. Yeah, this was something that I I had seen and kind of blew off just because, once again, it looks so generic, like the generic of the most generic of the most generic type of games. But I'm really glad to hear that this actually has some good game mechanics behind that, because even if it tends to look and maybe even play a little generic, if it's a good game, it's a good game. So, yeah, I might have to kind of revisit this one. Yeah, man, I haven't played it yet, but I did pick it up. So here in the next couple of weeks, I'll review it. But I think it just has that AG thing of like, like Tiny Towns did of like, it looks like a nothing, but then you play it and you're like, oh, it's actually pretty good. So we'll see if that is the case. All right. So that's everything from our acquisition disorders. Anthony, let's hear about the games you got to the table at Gen Con and let everyone know if those games are a buy and they should run out and pick those games up. If those games are a play and they should sit down and play them. If those games are a dodge and they should avoid Gen Con at all costs, or if those games are a dreaded burn, and they shouldn't even attend Gen Con whatsoever. So what do you got for us this week? <laughs> um, yeah, so I played about 20-ish games Whoa. at Gen Con. Some of them, I know. Yeah, some of them pretty short, obviously, because that's what demos end up being. But I was very happy. I got a lot of games in. I'm going to save some of those because I'm going to do longer, fuller reviews in the future. Some of those games are very long, too, so I want to play them a few more times. Sure. So these are not like... These are shorter games that I feel comfortable making some kind of initial recommendation on. But keep in mind, I played these once, possibly twice at a convention. So it's not like I've been playing this for a month and you should go buy it. But I can tell you what I'm doing, whether I'm buying it or not. So the first of these is Mega City Oceania. Uh, This is I don't know who's publishing this, honestly. It says Hub Games, but they had it at the Day booth. I don't understand how any of this industry works anymore. Every company owns another company and they all release the same games. But I played it at the Asmodee booth actually a couple times because when I was leaving, they had a spot and I was like, oh, this was fun. It's a dexterity game, but it's got a little bit more depth to it. So you have a bag full of different pieces, the little plastic pieces that come in three different colors uh, for glass, steel and concrete, I think. You will also be picking up different contracts. You'll be picking up different um land tiles that match the colors on the contracts and you're trying to complete various objectives and push the building into the center of the city and ideally have the tallest buildings the most buildings touching parks that have monuments in them the most buildings that match the best contracts and all that stuff so it does a lot of cool strategic things with the game but at the end of the day it's still a dexterity game where you have to take all those pieces stack them on the tile And then the really hard part is after you've stacked them, push them into the center of the board without it falling down. If it falls down, you lose your turn. You have to try again next time. So you've got to build it in a way where it's not going to collapse. Once it's in the city, it can collapse. It's fine. But before that, um, you got to get it there. I had a lot of fun with this. Like, I don't I like some dexterity games. I don't like some others. I'm not like the biggest fan in the world. But when I like one, I really like it. And I liked the way this one really makes you think strategically, not just about how you're stacking, but like the shapes of things, the locations they go into, the colors of different things, the bonuses you can pick up. It was a lot of fun. And like the table at the end of it looked really cool, like all the different pieces that were there. So this is one where I actually 
I went over to the Hub Games booth, which was separate from where I demoed it, and I picked up a copy because I did enjoy it a lot. And I feel like I'm going to play it a bunch, both with gamers and with the family. So that's Mega City Oceania. For me, it's a buy because I bought it. So. <laughs> well, that's a big recommendation there. Yeah, I, I really like the look of this. I can't wait to get this to the table myself. All right, next up is Old West Impresario from Tasty Minstrel Games. Uh, this is a tableau builder, and it it's a very simple mechanic. It, on your turn, at the beginning of the round, actually, you're going to all roll dice. Those dice numbers are going to go above these six different row columns that you have available to, with tiles in them. You will then, on your turn, pick one of those dice and do one of a few things with it. You can take a tile from that column. You can activate all the tiles in your tableau with that number on it or you can trade it in for money. And that's it. You just go around and you keep doing that until all the tiles are gone and you see who has the most points. There are something like eight or nine different types of buildings that all kind of chain off of each other and do different things. Um, there's ways to like generate people to come to your town. Also, there's ways to lose them. There's a way to hurt other people, but also hurts yourself sometimes. Uh, I had a lot of fun with this. And it was one of those rare instances where in the, in the actual demo hall, I could sit down and play a full game like they they played the full game through. So it was only like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, but it was quite enjoyable. I don't know if it has enough staying power. Like once you have a game like that and all the different types of tiles, I don't know how long it's going to last and how many times I want to play it. But my one play of it was rather enjoyable. So I'm interested. I think it's worth a play for sure, because it does a lot of interesting, cool things um, with that tableau building mechanic. I don't think it's doing anything particularly unique. I think it just does what it does pretty well. So definitely check out Old West Impresario, though, if you see it at the table. All right, next one up is Shobu. This is from Smirk and Laughter Games, our buddy Kurt over there. This is an abstract game in which you have four different boards, two of them dark, two of them light, and you have all of your stones on one side and then on the other side. So they're all facing you on either side of it. Uh, 16 total stones. You will move one stone uh, in the back end on your turn. And then on the opposing color, you will move the other one, the exact same amount of space. So it is pure abstract, but it's very pretty and it is very simple. And I really liked that about it. We sat down and played this Thursday before we dug into City of the Big Shoulders for, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes, but we got through like four or five games of it. It feels a lot like Go or Chess or something where very, very simple mechanics, but there's a lot of strategic depth to it that kind of unfolded as we played multiple games. So it is uh, it's one that I was very impressed by. I definitely want to pick it up. I ran out of time actually to pick it up because I, I left a little early on Sunday, but I am probably going to track down a copy because it's it's one of those um, abstract games that instantly grabbed me. And I like abstract games, so keep that in mind. But it did instantly grab me and say that it wanted to be played more. So <laughs> I'm going to probably track this one down. All right. So that's everything from our at the table, Anthony, let's get on to everything that went down on Gen Con and let's walk our listeners through your post game show from Gen Con. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we do this differently every year. Obviously I was the only one there this year. So like awards don't make a ton of sense other than me just saying the things I like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I thought it'd be fun just kind of go through some of the highlights of the show. People are always asking, like, what do you do there? What's unique? What did you see that was different? And I don't know. <laughs> like, it's I'm My experience is so different than anybody else's. Like I, I said earlier, it's hard to say what is great and what's not great. But um, but yeah, I mean, it was a lot of good fun either way. The first thing that probably to point out is that in the past, Every previous year that I've gone, I've gotten into the uh, vendor hall an hour early because they used to give out uh, tickets to press if you get in the line early enough to get in there an hour early, which is great because it gave me a chance to talk to people and walk the hall and take pictures without the crowds. This year, they got away with all of that. So there's none, no early access for press. There's no early access for VIGs anymore. So everybody gets to stand in the big lines, which is the first time I did that. And it was fun, though. I got to meet a lot of people, actually met somebody who lives in Seattle, like three blocks from where I used to live and goes to the game store that is on the corner I knew that didn't exist when I was there. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And kind of share notes on what we were going to try to track down. Like I said, that's how I 
wanted wandered into a demo of Obscurio because I hadn't heard of it before, but I uh, was talking about it with these guys. And so that was a pretty fun experience, like the people chanting and roaring and everything as they get used to it. Uh, I, I never had been a part of that. So that was kind of an interesting, uh, fun, new thing that I got to do. Um, and in the end, I got the line I wanted to quickly enough that it was worth getting there a little bit early. So that was fun. The other thing I did on the first day, other than, you know, walk the hall and pick up some games and, and try to track down what the hotness would be on that first day was, of course, go to the uh, charity event that takes place at the at the ballroom, uh, the Union Station ballroom. Uh, they, they do this every year. Uh, J.R. Honeycutt puts this together and they raise money for the charity uh, of what that Gen Con is partnered with for that year. So that's always a good time. There's a lot of people there, just a lot of pick up games you can kind of sit on on and, and see what everybody bought on the first day and try to get a part of those games. Uh, the in past years, it was interesting. So in past years, they wouldn't always open the bar or serve food or anything. This year, they at least did that much. So it was a little more hopping than it usually is, at least at the time I was there. Uh, it didn't stick around for too long just because, you know, there was other games to be played <laughs> in other places, but it's always a good time. And it's cool to see them do that charity event every single year, especially in like one of the larger spaces they have available. It's a pretty cool thing. One of the other cool things about a convention like this, like Chris, mm -hmm. like you mentioned this earlier in the show, is you get to meet people that you wouldn't otherwise get to meet. So, you know, some designers, a lot of designers live very, very far away. And even if you just go to local conventions and meet some local designers, you're not going to meet like Uwe Rosenberg or Stefan Feld. But if you go to Gen Con, you might meet Stefan Feld, <laughs> which is very cool. So, uh, I did get a chance to like get sat down and played a game. He helped us with the rules. He talked with us a little bit while we played and even managed to get a photo with him and, and share a little bit of my, uh, my love for his games, <laughs> a little bit of fanboying there. And it was, it was really cool. Like it's not something you'd ever get to do at another con. Like he doesn't come to the United States very often for conventions. And so this was a really cool experience. Now I'd wish I'd brought a game or a game manual for him to sign or something. I did not do that, but did get a photo. So it's memorialized. Nice. It did happen. <laughs> yeah. So that's a pretty cool thing. Obviously there's plenty of game designers there. It's, you know, a room full of them but just the, the ones who don't generally make it out there. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. So it seems like you played some fantastic games. Obviously, we talked about their acquisition disorders, things you got to see. Obviously, all of these pictures are up on Facebook, so check out facebook.com backslash BGA so you can check out all of Anthony's tremendous photography work here of these great components and games. And you got to meet Stefan Feld, which I am completely jealous of because he's my all-time favorite there so it was really fantastic to see him at the convention a little surreal a little, to be honest with you I, I think if i actually did come across him i would just totally fanboy out and be like ah you the guy with the games yeah good 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 you man you know so they'd be very my broken english would be far far worse than his his broken english so i i think we would have a moment or two but nonetheless that's really fantastic that you got a chance to meet him I know you've collected his games for a very long time, so uh, what, a, what, a, what a treat. But overall, and I know that this is not an official, so to speak, best of the best show kind of thing, but why don't you give us some of that? Give us a little hits on the, you know, the hottest booth you might have seen, something creative, some of the hottest games, you know, where were the lines, what were the people talking about, what people were playing, you know, just give us some of the best of the best. Yeah, yeah, the booths are always interesting, you know. This year, Simon kind of toned it down a bunch because they weren't selling their own games, so they weren't quite the the big spectacle that they've been in the past. Obviously, they had a ton of space, but other people picked up the slack. Upper Deck did their typical big stunt that they do. So their release was Legendary James Bond, which I have zero interest in because, again, I don't like the Legendary system, but I love their booth. So they had like a tunnel to get into the booth that was shaped like the, mm -hmm. you know, the... You like viewed it at kill. Yeah, exactly. And you could get pictures in there, which is really cool. And then inside, they had an Aston Martin just sitting there with its lights on. <laughs> so <laughs> you couldn't get in the car, but you could take pictures with the car. And it was just cool, like a cool little environment to go in and demo the game. Another really, really hopping booth uh, was uh, Big Potato. They 
basically recreated a blockbuster uh, to promote their new game, Blockbuster. It's like a movie trivia game, which is not a bad movie trivia game, by the way. If you're looking for one, they have it at Target. Uh, It's not my cup of tea, but it was enjoyable. But they recreated Blockbuster. They had they brought in like hundreds of old VHS tapes, like real ones, uh, to go next to the game that they had on the shelves there. The employees were all wearing Blockbuster shirts. They had Blockbuster bags that they were giving out. So that was really cool. Uh, You don't see people go that far very often. And obviously that's an IP that's easy to get up now because that company doesn't exist. So (laughs) whoever owns it is probably selling it for cheap. So that was pretty interesting. I feel like the, uh, the number of games that I saw people rushing for was much more diversified than in past years. There were a few like big must have games. Like I mentioned, Point Salad was really big. Black Angel, which is what I was going for, was really big. Apparently, they actually brought in extra copies somehow, which kind of annoyed me a little just because I rushed there so early. But I'm glad more people got it, so I'm not really annoyed. It uh, looks to be a very good game. But the stuff that would sell out daily uh, seemed to be generally like the smaller box stuff. So I saw a lot of people picking up and playing Letter Jam, which is the new word game from CGE. Watergate was a huge hit. Uh, from Capstone. And Capstone was selling all their stuff. So Watergate, Pipeline, the Ragusa, which just shipped out, all of those were selling like crazy. But Watergate in particular uh, seemed to be one I saw a lot of places in a lot of hotels, like a lot of people playing that one. So that seemed pretty hot. King Domino Duel, ironically, another two-player game uh, was another one I saw a lot of places. Parks uh, was extremely in demand and they were selling out of it every day. So there's a lot of those. It's usually there's like two or three like, oh, everybody needs this game. But this time there was like, I don't know, maybe half a dozen. Everybody needs this games. And it was kind of spread out more evenly. One other booth that I kind of wanted to throw out there, not necessarily because it was amazing, but just because it was confusing and a little frustrating was the Funko verse booth. So Funko bought Forest Prusan Creative, which has done a bunch of things like the Bob Ross game and uh, all those games that you see in target and they made a Funko game. So it's, it's a big board with little miniature Funkos moving around doing stuff. I didn't really demo it. And the reason I didn't demo it is because they had this ridiculous system set up where they rented out a room in the convention center, which is great, but you had to have a ticket to get in. And they were basically sold out by the time Saturday morning when I went to talk to them. So you couldn't get in unless you, bought generics and went over there and hope they had space for you like okay (laughs) it's interesting way to do this now the really obnoxious thing that people seemed annoyed by and this is probably like limited stock thing so i get it but it's just weird is the only way to buy the game is if you did a demo in that room so if you want to buy this game you needed to go and get a ticket or multiple generics then wait in line and then demo the game and then purchase the game so like they're asking a whole bunch of your time just to go buy a game. And that doesn't seem cool at all. So I don't have any impressions on that. A couple of people actually asked me about it. I'm like, I didn't get a chance to try it because of this ridiculous system they had set up. Now, I'm sure I could have made an appointment as press in advance. It's one of the few perks that we do have going in there. But I didn't know they were going to do this. So <laughs> there's no, no re- I've never seen this before. Nobody's ever done this. So I'm not going to harp on it forever, but it was weird. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, a it was a very busy, very vibrant crowd as usual and very evenly distributed. There were of course, like other things that maybe aren't always in Mm -hmm. our radar, like Pathfinder 2.0 launched. And so that was huge. They had huge, huge lines the first day or two, and they were actually selling it in various locations throughout the convention center, not even in the hall, Nice, just to make sure people could get the game. Um, Shadowrun Edition also came out, so that one, but that one sold out pretty quick. Mm. So a lot of big RPG launches this year too, which I think was a big part of the show. Not again, not my thing. It's not something I'm going to go pick up, but I knew a lot of people who were in those lines trying to get that stuff. All right, so it sounds like overall a great time was had. Legendary designers were met, and board games were plentiful but you had to play some sort of really obscure kind of game mechanic to even buy one of these games so i I guess overall it was gen con right (laughs) yeah there was nothing like 
I, I, I'd say the one takeaway I had, I guess two, is there were a lot of booths there demoing big, expansive, massive games from Kickstarter sure. that weren't selling anything, which was weird because it costs a lot of money to be there. And there was very few games that sold mm. out completely. So at the end of the weekend, you could still find Machi Koro Legacy. They still had Era. They had copies of Black Angel until the end of Saturday. You could still get Watergate. Like all these hot games, if you go to the hot, like the Geek Buzz list, most of those were available through the weekend, which is not, I wouldn't consider that super common. There's always a few that just are gone, gone, but not as many this year as I'm used to. Well, it seems like overall a good time. And if you'd like, to know more about this, reach out to us on BoardGamersAnonymous.com. All right, Anthony, so that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you all a seat at the table. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Dicetowernetwork.com